Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for coming. My name's Dave, and I'm here to talk to you about some market research and a project to get under the skins of gardening consumers of all types. I'm going to share with you, I suppose, three strands to the research. First of all, generations of gardener, different types of gardener, who they are, what they like, what they like doing. Second of all, we're going to have a look at how they work through the generations. Uh, it's going to come as no surprise to you that gardening is very much influenced by life stage, so home ownership, having children, retirement, etc. So we're going to take a look at that, and we're going to have a look at how those generations influence each other. We're finally going to have a look at the so what behind that. So it's all very well identifying these different types of gardener, but what can you do with it as a business? How do you find them? What does that mean for the different types of promotions? So that's the whistle-stop tour of what we're going to go through. And first of all, I'm just going to set the background in terms of the retail market as it stands at the moment. It's worth about four and a half, five billion pounds. It's been staying fairly stable over the last few years. 2008 being a slight exception with the crisis in consumer confidence, very poor weather in the spring there as well. But by and large, in the recession, it's a market that's been holding its own. It's fairly flat, fairly stable. Good market to be in. But there's some key differences there, and don't agonize over the numbers. This is having a look at where consumers shop according to how old they are, so where they buy garden products. Those 25 to 45-year-olds, what you're going to see there is there are more consumers in that age group who are purchasing their products in the DIY channel sector than the garden center sector. And when we move on through life, we'll see that that proportion gradually flips. So there's something in there in terms of channel choice between the garden centers and between the DIY stores. And if you look right below that, you'll even see the mail order having that preponderance to the older, more keen gardeners who have been more experienced there into the plant purchasing, etc. And in terms of plant purchasing, we're going to have a look at the different types of categories and how they appeal to different types of consumer, again, by age. The score along the left there is an index. So if you're getting a score of more than 100 on that, then the categories that we're going to look at make up a greater proportion than you would expect of your garden spend. So if you're seeing those points above 100, you're more keen on getting it. Less than 100, you're less keen on getting it. So let's have a look at bedding. Bedding plants there, much more preponderance to purchase that amongst the older consumer groups. And as you might expect, when you look at the plant care types of areas, it follows that very similar pattern. When I start looking at some of the more leisure type products within the garden categories, we're starting to see the inverse of that. And we've seen it for barbecues as well. So we're starting to see some very, very different purchasing patterns, some very different channel choices there, certainly according to age. Okay? Well, okay, that's fine. There's more to it than age, though. There's income, there's having children, there's all the rest of it there. So we needed to start to unpick some of that. So to get some better descriptions, if you like, than older consumers and younger consumers. And we needed to link that to the then what. So if you're using this, if we can describe those different types of consumers, how do we help you find them? How do we help you do advertising? door drops, direct mail, and all the rest of it that make them relevant to a retail business? Well, the answer was that we have been running a big project with Experian. And Experian, for those of you who don't know, are absolute specialists in this area. They've done some great work with a number of organizations to really try and understand customer bases, consumers, and to link them to postcode ba databases. So the Mosaic system many of you will be familiar with and they have come up with nine distinct types of garden consumer. Now you'd be very relieved that I'm not going to go through those nine point by point and describe them to you. What I'm going to do in the next bit is just flag a few of these and talk to them in a little bit more detail about what makes them unique and the types of information that over the next month or so we'll be making available free to our members in terms of garden spender profiles and portraits. Because those different types, they arrange themselves in terms of how keen they are in terms of gardening. 
So right at the top left there, we have what we're calling gardening seniors. They spend a reasonable amount on gardening. They're by and large retired. They're in and out of the garden centres during the week. High users of garden centre cafes. And gardening is a real pursuit for them. They love the skills. They love the time there. Right through to what garden? The least keen. We're talking about sheltered accommodation here. Tower blocks, as the name suggests. There's relatively little interest, availability of gardening with that type of catchment area. So what I'm going to do now is really highlight three of those segments to give you an idea of the types of information that's going to be available and how they relate to each other. And I'm going to start with that Garden Proud segment. What do we know about them? Well, as you might expect, they are very, very high spenders on garden products of all sorts, much higher than average. They're affluent. You know, they're not quite empty nest there, but the children aren't running around in the garden anymore. They're out. So that garden is a real place for them to enjoy. They love the gardening skills. But they perhaps haven't got quite the same amount of time as the gardening elders to enjoy that. They're in larger houses than normal, pretty expansive areas to take care of, and their gardens have got lots of stuff in them, be it plants, features, decking, etc. Believe it or not, they like Gardener's World. They are one and a half times more out likely than average to be choosing to watch BBC Gardener's World. And the other types of stuff that we'll be making available and that really go into describing these different types of gardeners and telling them apart from each other are things like how often they visit the garden centre. So we're seeing here that these blobs to the right show that they visit the garden centres much more frequently than other types of consumer. In fact, the only one where they under-index is for people who are never going to garden centres. These people are making up a very important part of the garden centre core customer base. Why do they go there? Well, actually, it's all about the plants, garden care, the garden leisure products, not quite so much as the gardening seniors who tend to over-index on a lot of these things, so going to meet friends, the availability of time, the garden centre catering, etc. What have they got in their gardens? Lots more than average of everything. Big gardens, enthusiasm for gardening, and in terms of being interested in planting stuff, so growing that plantsmanship, again, they're spending and intending to do more than the average. But of course, that's not the same as what do they buy. So within these indices, we have a look at what types of category different consumers buy. And that interest, that does translate with this consumer group into interest in purchasing plants. So we're getting, I beg your pardon, I'm getting ahead of myself actually. So what we have is much more interest in the plants and plant care. So tying back with that earlier chart. And about average purchasing in terms of the garden furniture and barbecues. So not that there's zero interest, but certainly with this segment, we're starting to see that life stage play out. So they're getting into the plants, they're getting into the garden. The gardening is becoming for them an area of spend, an area of leisure. So moving on to our fresco aspirations. What are they? Well, they are high income professionals. They're young, they're on the cusp of the first home. It's by and large new homes. Small patio gardens, balconies, you know, indoor planting, etc. They lack knowledge and ideas about how to do gardening. They need ideas, information on how to make gardening relevant for their different areas. And gardening itself is not so much of a pursuit. It is about what the garden can provide for them. It's about entertaining, socialising, having good quality times with a friend, these guys do not like getting their hands dirty. They lack the ideas, they lack the time, they're very career focused and the rest of it. And I'm gonna show you a little bit now. So we've been running some in-depth focus groups with these types of consumers and um, I've been to these over the last six weeks. So this is about as current as you're gonna get it. I'm gonna put into words what these consumers say about their gardens. Can everybody read that fine? Okay. The curios to focus on. Now we own our own place, more time than ever around each other's houses. So that's staying at home, the retreat to the home in tough times. 
not just about the flowers and shrubs. Okay, it's another extension of your home. It's another room. It's the whole outdoor room that we're familiar with. The whole stylish extension of your house. And there's a whole Jamie Oliver zeitgeist there as well. So these people have picked up on the come dine with me vibe. I mean, we've all seen the stuff in home base about their branding the Jamie Oliver goods. These are the types of messages and images that resonate well with these types of consumers. So it's about style, it's about lifestyle, it's about what the garden can do for them. It's not how do they get involved in raising lots of plants. But what happens when they get a little bit older, when they start to have children, when they move on a little bit in their careers, and the house perhaps gets that little bit bigger? Because there's another distinct group here called family focus, and that really is a tightly defined age group, but by and large they have young children. They're not babies in arms, they're primary age children by and large. They're can potentially going to run around in the garden, they're going to get involved in mum and dad in Grow Your Own. The garden's a place for them to enjoy together as a family, absolutely still to socialise and entertain. But certainly in the focus groups that we've started to pick up is that the garden is starting to become a place to socialise as a family. So as your friends and families have young children, it's somewhere where they can bring to enjoy a safe place. It's taking the place perhaps of the pub, the eating out, which is perhaps a little bit more of a hassle now you've got children to look after. It is that nice, safe, enjoyable space that you can take a bit of pride in. And these consumers are the ones who are much more likely than anyone else to be influenced by school gardening. When we ran a survey of Ipsos Mori uh, just back in the spring, we found that the school gardening movement is getting incredible traction out there. So around about 40% of parents of primary school age children claim that their school had communicated with them about the activities that they were doing in schools around the gardening, whether that's collecting vouchers or mentioning it in newsletters. And that, again, is something that certainly comes back at us through those consumers and what they're saying in real life. Yeah, we're picking up on those children getting into gardening and getting mum and dad into the gardening. So they want to have a go, they want to help out. Mum and dad want to be out there and enjoy that and be out there together as the family. And this is not about teaching the children laboriously how to garden. It's about enjoying that quality time together, having fun, planting stuff, having a little Mr. Potato Head with the crest. It's that type of thing that they really enjoyed. And there's a level of nostalgia with these consumers as well. I mean, looking at that bottom quote there, it's about giving something back. It's about the taste of the good life. It's about what they had as kids. You know, how can they provide that? And it's harking back to their parents as well. And certainly parents and passing on that knowledge through the generations, they do represent an opportunity to engage this type of consumer. Those different types of consumers, we've had a look at how they span in terms of keenest to least keen and more marginals. But as we just had a look at their life stage is hugely important in defining attitudes to gardening, as is disposable income, size of house, and all the other things that go into that. And so what I'm going to have a look at is how these different segments link together and how there's, I suppose, traffic between those different generations. I don't panic about trying to memorize where those all go. I'm going to talk you through how this pans together. What we have at the start is a segment with what garden. So think about people living in digs, perhaps you're still living with parents, small house, balcony, flat, etc. There's no real potential there. But as they move into their own homes, they're into that alfresco aspiration set, or perhaps a more basic set of expectations that we're calling backyard barbecues, where the emphasis is more on keeping the garden neat and tidy, the occasional barbecue or gathering, you know, the odd plant to make it look nice, keep it tidy, etc. Again, largely dictated by income, size of garden when you're getting there. There's a small segment, bare and basic, where frankly income does play a part. Uh, we're looking at very stretched, indebted families there, struggling to keep their heads above water. Um, high mortgage payments, high levels of debt, but on the other side, we've got the family focus type segment where there are those levels of affluence, where there is that interest in gardening, where is the house with a nice garden to provide opportunities. Of course, that family focus, that emerging interest in gardening and plantsmanship, when those children fly the nest, when there's more time, when there's 
less of a conflict in the garden about having trampolines and footballs in there. That does start to switch into one of two ways. We've got that garden proud segment that we looked at there. And for the people who don't get into that, we've got a segment that we call convenience gardening. Now, these types of consumers are the ones who don't tend to spend or claim to spend very much time on doing housework. They're the types of consumers who, when we asked them in the spring, said they intended to spend more in the future on gardening services. They're the ones who tend to spend more time focused on the career there. So again, there's perhaps a little segment there that is about convenience as well as the passion for gardening. What we have as well, again, it's picking out that distinction that there's no such thing as you know, older gardeners are more keen, etc. We have ageing ambivalence here. This is people for whom income is quite stretched. Gardening isn't so much of a passion. There's a relative interest in it, so they'll quite like to read some of the gardening magazines and BBC Gardener's World. They'll have some friends, they'll meet the garden centre occasionally. But gardening for these people isn't really much of a passion and it doesn't translate into purchases. It's the occasional type of stuff that they'll buy. Whereas on the other hand, we have the gardening seniors. Now they are absolutely passionate about gardening. They cannot get enough of it. You know, by and large retired, it is a pursuit. They're in and out of the garden centres all through the year, not in the peak season. And they love talking about it. They influence other people. In particular, they influence those younger segments. They're the first port of call in many cases for advice on what you can do with your garden, where you can go for garden shopping. And there's some anecdotal evidence that we're picking up that they're also a potential source of information on garden offers, garden products, garden promotions, advocacy for garden outlets. So if you're sitting on top of a customer base of these people, there's a potential opportunity to use them to influence people earlier in the life stage into your products and your opportunities. And I'll show you what I mean by that. Because they are worth around a quarter to a fifth of the markets. That is around the billion pound mark here and now in terms of their plants and garden leisure spending. So yeah, absolutely worth bringing on for tomorrow. But here and now in the today, they're a very, very important segment. For them, the garden, as I said, is all about the leisure, it's about the lifestyle, it's about the fun. It's not about expansive, massive gardens that you can't empathize with. It's not about being a pastime for old people. It's not about it being a chore. It's sociable, compact and manageable. If you've got those children, it's about having fun with the kids, etc. In terms of the imagery in those focus groups that the people thought they liked, that appealed, it's the Jamie Oliver, it's the Brian Cox, it's the types of things that they can imagine in their gardens, that they can think, yep, you know what, I can do that. Given a menu card, I can see that, I can believe it. And it's the quirky as well. Um, our moderator for this um, was thinking about going into business on her own, selling these boots. I'm a little sceptical myself, but there was overwhelming liking for that stylized, that quirky, that's something that they can think is going to be a little bit more unusual, a talking point around the garden entertaining. But it wasn't about getting hands dirty. It wasn't preachy or about, I suppose, getting in touch with plant knowledge and the Latin and the rest of it. It wasn't about that. For sure, they want to know how to do it. For sure, they want the ideas. But it wasn't about um, going back to school and learning this. It wasn't about getting a master's in horticulture. It was about making it easy. They enjoy it enough. And in terms of some of those points, what types of things were they themselves saying in those groups? Well, in terms of the role of mum and dad there, yeah, very, very important. And I'm just picking some representative quotes here. There are, there are more of them. But again, very interested in this one. Okay. People passing on offers there. And it's entirely in line with the trends that we're seeing outside of the garden market. So the passing on of discount vouchers, you know, the whole voucher codes mentality. You know, thrift is fashionable. And to get that deal, to pass that on, does a feel to be an opportunity there. School gardening, again, comes out you know, within that family focus. It is almost ubiquitous. And let's not forget the people who have brothers and sisters, who are aunts and uncles to these people as well, who perhaps get involved on the visits. 
So to not understate the importance of school gardening and keeping that buzz, that, um, that enthusiasm around gardening going. But of course, one of the things I haven't talked about yet is the importance of store, and the store environment and in-store. Okay. And whether or not it was in that DIY channel or whether it was in the garden centre, there was a real demand for help within the store environment there. Okay. Whether it's around making your home, making the home look beautiful, and the shopping trip being an extension of that. Okay. Still opportunity to show me what the plants look like, opportunity to give me ideas, opportunities to give handouts on how to do this type of thing, how to achieve the look. Or if it's an afternoon out, that leisure shopping trip out into the country, if it's around the gift and homeware there, or just getting your garden done or getting some plants, again, that same demand from specialist garden retailers. Give me ideas, show me how we want to be inspired, but we want to be inspired at our own level and with context of our own gardens. So the types of things that we've looked at and that we tested with these people and showed, it was absolutely about how do we achieve the look. Show me how the types of things are, you know, how to plant up, how to get the look. How long is it going to take? You know, if I've got an afternoon, fantastic. If I've just got a couple of hours, what are the types of things that we could do for that? So to give that information in store and at the point of sale, again, was something that those consumers were really, really asking for. Groupon. Again, that came up as a way of getting the consumers into store. This came up really without very much prompting. So how do we get in there? We mentioned that thrift is fashionable. I'm going to show you some stats on Groupon that were taken just last week from a site called Alexa.com, which has a look at the types of consumers that are visiting different websites. Well, we've seen a huge rise since the middle of 2010 in use of Groupon. No great surprise there. And in terms of the types of consumer who are using it, you know, younger, you know, certainly the under 35s, 35, 35 to 40 to an extent, female, educated graduates. So again, in terms of that family focus, those um, alfresco aspirations, in terms of getting them in, giving them the ideas, it feels to be an opportunity and certainly an opportunity that a um, number of our trade, a number of our retailers have started to see some returns on. But above all, make it accessible. Show me what it looks like. Show me how the plants can be used in store. Give me the ideas. But having understood that, it comes back to the then what, doesn't it? Okay, so we painted those pictures, all those nine possible segments. If any of those are right for your businesses, if you decide, yep, those are the consumers we want to get, well, how do you do that? How do you find a list? How do you find out if they're living close to you? What is it sensible to do in terms of promotion or trying to design your store around that? Well, over the next couple of months, we'll be launching a new product uh, in association with Experian, which looks at those different segments, looks at the descriptions that make them unique, looks at the information behind it in terms of garden purchasing, garden shopping, the amount they spend, let's not lose sight of that. And we will be calling it garden spender maps. So they are definable for your areas, and they will show you what types of consumer are living within a given drive time of your store, and how that compares with the national average. So in this example, which we've mocked up, this particular garden center has 125,000 households within 20 minute drive time. Quite a few of them are those younger garden segments that we talked about there. Uh, there's relatively few in this example who are those gardening seniors. So we start to think about the types of offer, the types of store environment that could appeal to these types of consumers, assuming that that is what you want to do. Do they live anywhere near? Well, within this product, you will be able to map within that drive time area where those different types of consumers live in relation to your store. So we have the store flagged on the map there with the main roads. And the green dots represent the little areas where those types of consumers most cluster. These guys, they appear to have clusters of those family focus. So if they want to have a look at that there, areas they might think about are door drops, school gardening projects with the primary schools in these types of areas. So it's making it that little bit more real, that little bit more actionable. And in terms of 
the types of actions that you can take on that, whether it's door drops, whether it's direct mail, whether it's mailings to your own customer database. They can all be profiled against those different types of consumer and related to postcode. So what you're looking at there is the postcode sectors where those alfresco aspirations are most likely to live. So within NG15, there are 828 alfresco aspirations households. They account for 89% of that postcodes, sectors, households. So if you're going to go to the likes of Royal Mail and TNT and do door drop activity, put something uh, alongside the free paper, it's this type of information that will let you work out the optimum areas to door drop, the optimum areas to target, according to the types of consumer that you want to get into your store. So if I was going to sum up, there are probably three things that um, you can watch this space for in terms of the HTA that we'll be bringing out. First of all, the continuum that we talked about there, so those different types, those different portraits, those different profiles of gardeners. All the information behind them will be available to download from HTA free of charge to members. The local reports will be working with Experian to make those available from uh, November, sort of time, October, November. They, will, they won't be free, I'm afraid to say, but uh, we're working on the pricing for those. I think what's coming out of it for me in terms of the qualitative research is just how different some of those sectors are and just how distinct some of those consumers' needs are from each other, and just how many of their opportunities there are to understand that, take advantage of it, particularly given whatever strategy you want to put together for the future and for the short-term marketing activities. It could be tremendously powerful. And it's actionable locally as well. You know, if you're an independent retailer, it's all very well me standing up and giving you a market research presentation saying that nationally, you know, older gardeners spend so much. This takes it down a level and it makes it very, very relevant and applicable to your particular areas. So that really is a whistle-stop tour of the type of stuff that we've been doing. I'm going to end there. Um, if you'd like to find out more or be contacted when those profiles and those maps, etc., become available, I do have some forms out the front. Uh, please leave your name, address, and we'll get back to you on that to let you know when they're launched. Um, if you've got any questions, anything like that, please do grab me afterwards. But um, otherwise, thank you very much for your time.